a number of guests who introduced my fellows take leave to attend your meeting. Is it your pleasure that I welcome them in your name? Thank you. Minute. Apologies. <laughs> Burlington House and Online, Professor Martin Millett, President and the Chair. The minutes of the previous ordinary meeting of April 7th, 2022, were read and signed. The President thanked the two retiring council members, Professor Vincent Gaffney and Dr. Samantha Lucy, and Professor Christopher Skull, who had stepped down as director after the last anniversary meeting. Since the ballots for director and two ordinary members of the council were uncontested, the president declared elected through period 2022 to 25 as director, Dr. John Cooper, as ordinary members of council, Dr. Anne McSween and Professor Simon Kaner. President and former presidents, Professor Martin Howard, Ms. Jill Andrews and Mr. Paul Drury expressed their warmest thanks to Mr. John Lewis, general secretary who retired at this meeting. The president announced that following the ballot, which closed earlier that day, following were elected fellows of the Society of Antiquaries. Amy Jeffs, Michelle Langley, Ivan Los Loskutov, Daryl Ogier, Daniel Poor, Adrian Randolph, Victoria Ridgeway, Barbara Shaler, Ben Shaw, Tanya Schreiber, Peter Van Alphen, Alan Williams, and Richard Ragg. The following being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statute would be admitted as fellows. Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence, the Right Honourable Sir Rupert Jackson, Dr. Elizabeth P. Fowden. The meeting approved the appointment of Moore Kingston Smith, LLP, as the Society's Auditors for 2022 to 23. The meeting approved the adoption of Order 6, Affiliate Member Scheme. The President read out a list of names of fellows removed since the last anniversary meeting. The President read out a list of names of fellows who have died since the last anniversary meeting. President read out a list of benefactors to the society for 2021 to 22, whom he thanked. The treasurer presented his annual financial statement. The president then gave his anniversary address and introduced Mr. Andrew MacDonald, the incoming general secretary. On the motion of Stephen Dunmore, treasurer, the following resolution was carried that the thanks of the meeting be returned to the president for his address and that he be requested to allow it to be published. The president signified his assent. The meeting was adjourned at 5.35 p.m. and was followed by the reception. Could we call on our final minutes of the two and complete the other order? Excuse me. Five certificates this evening, and I'm reading the short version, and um, please look online if you want to read the longer version. Marco Amoni, BA, MA, PhD, Research Fellow at the University of Durham, and a consultant curator working on the Byzantine and medieval periods. Lee Alston, MA, an independent architectural historian who has published widely. Catherine Barnett, MSc, PhD, Technical Director at Stantec, UK, where she bridges academic and commercial archaeology. Cornelius Barton, BA, a professional archaeologist and director of fieldwork for Southeast England. Christopher Kujamand, BA, MSc, PhD, a British Academy postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Liverpool, specialising in Viking studies. Is it your pleasure that these certificates be suspended in the usual manner? Um, I've only got uh, two announcements to make uh, this evening. Um, firstly, uh, we are continuing to promote the affiliate membership scheme, and it's very pleasing, as the President, to see uh, so many affiliates uh, joining us for the meeting this evening. And uh, I would remind fellows that um, there is a consultation period uh, currently um, operating for the revisions to Order 3. Uh, concerning our petition for election and balloting, and remind fellows that there is uh, an extraordinary general meeting and debate on the 20th of October at 4.15 p.m. in this room, uh, where we will uh, take feedback on those proposals 
Mike Ford as the artist of the ballet. And the text is at the commission rooms. The following being in attendance, and having signed the obligation required by the statute. I'm sorry, I'll just start that again and just get the microphone. <laughs> the following being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statute, desire to be admitted a fellow. Robert Athol, Catherine Ingram Smith, and Richard Ragg. Uh, Robert Athol. Uh, Richard Ragg. Catherine Ingram Smith. We now come to the main business of this evening's meeting, uh, which is to hear our lecturer. Um, Judith Pawley, our lecturer, is Professor of 18th Century Literature at Royal Holloway uh, University of London. Um, she's well known, I think, to many of you. She's published on a wide range of subjects in history, uh, from encyclopedias to private theatricals, and has edited texts such as uh, Tristan Shandy, The Work of the Blue Stocking, Elizabeth Parker. As a trustee of uh, Pope, Pope of Hope's Grotto Preservation Trust, she supports the current restoration of the Indian site and is a contributor frequently to programmes on BBC Radio 4 and is chair of the London Human Interest Lecture Series. She helps uh, greatly promote knowledge of the 18th century. At present, she's working on a cultural history of gin at Cambridge University Press. And her talk this evening from Gin Praise to Gin Palace, a chapter in the history of gin, uh, I think reflects that interest. Very welcome to Judith. Thank you. Today. I'm just going to wait till um, a switch has been switched. So while the laser display screen descends, uh, I wish you a, a warm welcome to those of you who are here and I, to those of you who are listening at home online. And I hope those of you who are at home have a, a suitable beverage uh, to enjoy while I, I speak. Can I check that everybody can hear and, and see? Oh, good, excellent. So let me show you the first slide, most obvious slide. You need to stop a moment. Internet problem, okay. I would hope that um, this would be broadcast in Elizabethan secretary hand and hand delivered on parchment. <laughs> I think we're probably good to go. Can't make it link. So, go try again. You can't see that. Okay, good. Um, it's showing up differently on, and it's it's screen sharing. Can I double double check because I'm seeing a different image on my screen from the one I saw before. You can see it. That'll do. I'm happy with that. Okay, so the next image is one which will be very familiar to to most of you. <laughs> 
It's uh, a famous pair of engravings by William Hogarth, Beer Street and Gin Alley, produced in 1751 as part of a concerted campaign to end what was perceived as a crisis of gin addiction, destroying the laboring classes. And um, as I'm sure you'll, you'll know that there's a, a contrast between the, um, uh, the, the healthy inhabitants of Beer Street and the, um, the unhealthy inhabitants of, of, of Gin Lane. Now, gin is currently very popular again, and some of the current marketing campaigns against particular brands seem to, to use as part of their, um, their appeal, their, their hook, this old association between gin and kind of naughtiness and degradation, that they like to make gin seem rather um, transgressive. There are brands called Mother's Ruin and Bathtub Gin. Though the, the gin that was drunk in the 18th century is, is very, very different from the gin, the gin that is marketed now. You, you might well know that the 18th century gin was a lot sweeter, it was very strongly flavored. Uh, it was drunk uh, at room temperature or very often mixed with, with warm water. The, the icing of drinks doesn't really come in until um, Americans start to mix their weird cocktails in the 19th century. Um, the introduction of tonic is a, is a 19th century thing too. So our gin is very different from them, but very often people are playing on um, an 18th century association. But you can't move nowadays for artisanal gins produced by micro distilleries in practically every town and village in England. The village where my sister lives, Mayfield in Sussex, has its own very quaffable gin, which I, I recommend to you. <laughs> I, I get no cut for this, but... Um, but the older established brands, which do have uh, very distinguished histories, are also dipping into their archives to find old recipes that can be revived and adapted for contemporary palates. And here we have Beefeaters, Burroughs Reserve, and Gordon's Sicilian Lemon, which I thought was one of these kind of slightly alco poppy gins, these kind of sweet, girly uh, gins that, that I think are marketed at probably at, at hen parties. Um, the hen party market, but actually um, Sicilian lemon is, is, is taken from an older recipe. Now, I don't know if any of you have visited gin distilleries or gin experiences, as they're often called. As, as some people are, are nodding, I, I go only for research uh, <laughs> purposes, you, you understand. There's, there's a common pattern in these tours, and I've been on a number of them, they tend to begin with an introduction to the stills, and the stills tend to have old-fashioned female names like Marjorie at Heyman's or Prudence at Sipsmith. And then they tell the, the history of gin, which tends to go thuswise. Gin was introduced at the time of the Dutch King William III. It was sold in gin shops, and these were low dives. And it was so cheap and addictive that by the mid 18th century, it led to a major problem for the poor and a moral panic known as the gin craze, as depicted in the Hogarth images I showed you earlier. A concerted campaign and government legislation uh, led to the, um, the situation getting under control and uh, a kind of decline in consumption. But then a new phase begins with the rise of the gin palaces in the 1820s and 1830s. And then the next um, chapter in the story is that tonic water gets introduced with the introduction of, of quinine and a, a desire to um, uh, help the colonial services um, avoid malaria. And then this becomes old fashioned and very sort of twin set and pearls. I'm wearing my pearls in honor of the old fashioned nature of the G&T. Um, once it becomes too respectable, it becomes unfashionable. And then it's eventually revived in this current wave, which is known as the genaissance. I kid you not, that appears in, in, in the literature. And this genaissance was, was led by the, the really rather wonderful team behind Sipsmith, which was launched in 2009. Now this familiar tale is also told in lots of popular books. I mean, you, again, you cannot move for you know, popular books on the subject of gin by every till, it seems. Um, and in most, most libraries, um, you will find these books. Um, 
um, Bloomsbury have one. Bloomsbury has a very good series on, on the history and culture of, of food. Um, and bizarrely, the British Library, which really ought to know better, and I can see some different people from the British Library now, have a series called The Philosophy of. And you, there's a philosophy of beards, of cheese. You know, who knew? Now, there's, there's a philosophy of gin. The slides aren't changing at all. I'm moving. Um, thank you very much for that. That's really helpful for you to let me know. This slideshow doesn't seem to be working. Um, it, I, it's moving on my screen. I wonder if my lovely helpers can come and sort this out for me. Thank you for letting me know. I wouldn't otherwise have, have known that. Yes, I, I mentioned earlier that um, the view I'm currently seeing is not the view I saw earlier. Yes, thank you very much. Brilliant. So um, there's Mayfield gin, strongly recommended. But other gins are available. Um, Beef Eaters, Barrows Reserve and Gordon's Sicilian Lemon. And proof that there is such a thing as the distillery experience. And here are two of the, um, the books that I mentioned, the, the, the popular histories. And it, it's, I mean, it's, I don't mean to be sort of snobby about this here. I'm talking to the Society of Antiquaries and, you know, and I'm not meaning to mock the, the popular history of, of gin, but what I'm, what I'm trying to do is to, is to unpick some of the reasons why the story of gin is told in this particular way and to, um, to, to measure that against uh, the records that can be found. And a lot of what I'm, I'm finding is that it's very, very difficult to get at a kind of archival truth about gin because even in the past, stories were being told about it. There has always been a kind of interpretive narrative around gin and what it, what it means. Now, um, I've, I'm trying to concentrate on a, a cultural history of gin, as, as I said, and at this uh, section um, on the gin palace is, is quite crucial to that because it is a major stage in this uh, ongoing narrative of gin. The, the gin palace uh, produced almost as much moral panic, if not more, than the gin craze. And because of increasing, in, uh, increasing print culture and other forms of uh, cultural awareness, it got disseminated very, very widely. And there are some good uh, books on the earlier gin craze. I'd strongly recommend Jessica Warner's uh, um, craze, Gin and Debauchery in an Age of Reason, and there are a couple of shorter works on the gin palaces that, that I can't find any very extended ones, but um, Mark Girard's Victorian Pubs, 1975, excellent book, um, and more recently Lee Jackson, Palaces of Pleasure, has a chapter on gin palaces, so there, there is some work being done. Um, and one of the, the starting points for our understanding of the Gin Palace is Charles Dickens. A lot of cultural commentators in the 1830s were writing accounts which seemed to be first-hand accounts of going into a Gin Palace. And it's usually a, a sort of um, an educated or a sensitive or a middle-class observer walking into hell. This sort of appalling place that left them reeling and sort of clutching at adjectives because something new was happening, um, according to them in the 1830s, that the, the, the poverty-stricken 
um, squalid uh, environment depicted by Hogarth was no longer that there. The gin was being drunk in a kind of an establishment that quickly became called the Gin Palace. And it's worth reading this description by Dickens, first published um, in serial form and uh, published in Sketches by Boz in 1836. I'm going to read it at length because so many of the features in it get repeated in newspaper articles, in other popular works, Pierce Egan's, um, um, Augustus Sala's accounts of London in the 19th century. So here we go, here's, here's Dickens. He's walking into this um, gin palace um, in Drury Lane, in, in sort of rookery area just south of Drury Lane. The gate building with the fantastically ornamented parapet, the illuminated clock, the plate glass windows surrounded by stucco rosettes and its profusion of gas lights and richly gilt burners is perfectly dazzling when contrasted with the darkness and dirt we have just left. The interior is even gayer than the exterior. A bar of French polished mahogany, elegantly carved, extends the whole width of the place. And there are two side aisles of great cast, painted green and gold, enclosed within a light brass rail and bearing such inscriptions as Old Tom, 549, Young Tom, 360, Samson, 1421. The figures agreeing, we presume, with the gallons understood the gallons of gin. Beyond the bar is a lofty and spacious saloon full of the same enticing vessels with a gallery running round it, equally well furnished. Behind it are two showily dressed damsels with large necklaces. <laughs> Dispensing the spirits and compounds, they are assisted by the ostensible proprietor of the concern, a stout coarse fellow in a fur cap put on very much on one side to keep him a knowing air and to display his sandy whiskers to the very best advantage. So these features, for, bizarrely, the clock um, comes up as a sort of uh, a source of, of, of dismay in these sort of elite accounts of the gin palace. And I, and I want to know why it is that they object to clocks being made available to the working classes. Um, people are horrified by the bright lights, by the, by the gaslight, and by the use of rich materials, especially mahogany and gilt and stucco. Very often the descriptions refer to um, classical columns supporting the, the facade in the exterior. And part of the problem here is the, the irony that this showy place with its beautiful barmaids, and, and the barmaid, there were competitions, I, I found um, newspaper accounts with photographs of you know, the, the top barmaid of the year, the sort of Miss World of barmaids um, for, for, for gin palaces. Um, and the irony is that the patrons of this luxurious place, of this meretricious emporia are largely drunken besotted men and wretched broken down miserable women, says Dickens. So the patrons are the people you see in Hogarth's um, engraving, but the surroundings are like the Ritz. And that seems to be the problem. There's something really wrong there. Now, Dickens' sketches by Boz, as you might well know, were illustrated by uh, George Cruikshank. And here you can see the cast, the, old, the, the, the large cast saying Old Tom 549 and so on. Um, you might be able to see the, the lovely barmaids. I can't see their big necklaces, but um, they, <laughs> they do look pretty lovely to me. And these rather sort of disreputable looking people children at the bar that's an image that will will come up again and again and i'll mention later on and so this is from 1836 in 1829 um he used very much the same sort of composition we have the long bar the lovely barmaid we have the the great big barrels but here you'll see that this is much more symbolic they're in the, sh the, the barrels and, and they're in the shape of coffins the lovely barmaid is enticing poor people in ragged clothing into this man trap. So the, the trap is going to close tight over them and the figure of death stalks behind. Cookshank returned to the idea of the gin shop again and again. He was a heavy drinker at, at this period and then he became um, a, a teetotal and a strong advocate of the temperance movement. He wrote this, uh, did a, a series called The Drunkard's Children, which means again, children, in a gin shop, and it ends with the most fantastic image of a, of a suicide. Um, and then here's a, another Cruikshank image from around the time of, of sketches by Boz, which shows the exterior here with the, 
sort of Corinthian columns, the large gas lamp that's often mentioned, the swing doors on patent hinges, that figure will come up again and again. And these uh, wretched people, um, Hogarthian people being thrown out onto the street. The, uh, the pubs and uh, licensed premises um, had to close on Sundays during church hours. So everybody is thrown out at church time onto the streets. Um, and Cruikshank calls it a gin temple. And Jin Temple and Jin Palace briefly rivaled each other in the, in the press until Jin Palace won out. It's another image which I'd love to go into, into, into more detail, another Cruikshank Im image from around the same time, the Jin Jagannath. And this is um, based on the, um, the Jagannath is, uh, is one of the manifestations of, of Krishna, I think. And there's a, a, a temple in India where they, run these chariots with images of the deity on them. So there's this idea of a temple. Um, and the British thought at this time that Indian worshippers threw themselves deliberately under the wheels to be crushed. And so this is symbolic of the way in which um, gin drinkers were sacrificing themselves to their addiction. It's more likely that by accident, people were, 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 were harmed and killed by these um, juggernauts, these temple chariots. And you have the lights, the clock, the egregious clock, and on the top, a copper still. This is the distilling equipment, which I think sort of alludes to the idea of a temple dome, perhaps. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of, of, of very potent work being done by these images. You also find in the press Again, in the 1830s, this, the 1830s seems to be a crucial period for the sort of the frenzy about gin palaces, just as the 1750s were um, a, a frenzy about the, the gin craze. And here's a, a really snappy article in the Royal Cornwall Gazette. Um, and I think that is a sign of, of how much the fear about the London gin palaces had spread to the provinces. You know, eventually, big gin palaces were opened in the northern industrial cities. Uh, the, I don't know that there are many gin palaces in, in Cornwall at that time. There might well be now, but I need another research trip to find, find out. Um, but the, Corn the Cornish Gazette was reporting, a new and splendid gin palace has just been opened within a few doors of the Bow Street Police Office. So close is the connection between crime and dram drinking. Thus are the bane and the antidote close together the gin palace to, to excite to crime and the police office to punish it. So it's, it's a wonderful um, conjunction. According to Lee Jackson, the term gin palace was coined by the press and specifically in an article in the Times on the 7th of December, 1821. And the Times eventually was one of the, the most vocal opponents of the gin palace and ran a, a long campaign against it. And it was recognized at the time how anti-gin the Times was. There were some other papers which were a little bit more pro-gin. So in, um, in the Times in 1821, there's an article headed, Increase of Drunkenness Amongst the Lower Orders. And it reports on the views of the Bow Street magistrate, Sir Richard Burney, who has become a zealous campaigner against the Jim Palace. And in this article, Burney expresses some sympathy for the drunk and disorderly prostitutes who came before him as the, at the, when he, in his magistrate's job. When he considered, this is a quotation from Burney, the temptations held out to them at the corner of every street to indulge in their unfortunate propensity for drink. The problem was both the low price of gin and the high style of the venue in which it was sold. In passing through Long Acre the other day, he, Bernie, was astonished to find that a little common public house which had been taken down and a building erected in its stead, which had more the appearance of a palace than a gin shop. What would be thought of a house for the sale of gin being built in a splendid style of architecture supported by Corinthian columns? So again, it's this notion of this classical uh, building being kind of squandered on the poor who really didn't, didn't deserve it. Now, it's not quite fair to say that, that this article coined the term gin palace. I mean, the, the two words come up in close proximity, but, they, but he doesn't exactly coin the phrase. 
Okay, but to summarize what I'm saying so far, there was a great deal of concern from the late 1820s into the 1830s, both about the quantity of gin being consumed by the poor and by the novel luxury of the surroundings in which they consumed it. And this emergence of the, uh, the gin palace, supposedly in the 1820s, late 1820s, appears also in the popular histories. And in her stylish and fluent Gin Glorious Gin, Olivia Williams claims that these new drinking holes mushroomed around the West End and out in the poorer suburbs through the 1820s and 1830s. And when I say suburbs here, um, we're not talking about kind of Croydon or Isha, we're talking about Southwark. You know, we're talking about the sort of just outside the, the city boundaries. She claims that gin palaces took off in earnest in 1829. Her first example is the um, Princess Victoria in Shepherd's Bush. This is how it appears today with a lot of cars very badly parked outside it. She says that it was a low grade gin shop, but in 1829, it was given a costly makeover to become one of the city's earliest gin palaces. Other early contenders, all from around 1829, um, apart from the Princess Victoria, Thompson and Coates, later Thompson and Fearon of Hoban Hill, the old Queen's Head on the Essex Road, Islington. There are others too, well as the Grapes in Old Street and at least one gin palace in Lamb's Conduit Street are all, um, turn, they're, they're all sort of jollied up at around this time. So very often there was a, a, a cheap gin shop there first. It was knocked down and rebuilt or other premises were bought and developed as very fancy gin palaces. According to Williams, at their peak, there were 5,000 gin palaces around the city. But most gin palaces fell out of fashion in the late Victorian period, and it was then that the Princess Victoria, which we saw earlier, was refitted as a pub. So my initial plan, and thinking about the, um, the, the very learned audience here, was to try to find every single one of those 500 gin palaces and to show you a beautiful map with each of them marked in, in red dots and perhaps different colored dots for different years and decades, and maybe layers in which you could see the, the gradual spread of these 5,000 gin palaces. But I have not been able to find them. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. And one is maybe I just haven't been looking in the right place. And I was talking earlier to people about the difficulty of, of getting hold of the archives that we need, even in uh, the days of, of, of the internet. But there are other problems. I mean, William's book is, 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 a, is, a, is a good book. It's a very lively book. And it's, um, there's a lot of good stuff in it, but there are no footnotes. She doesn't cite her sources, so I can't track her in her own snow. Um, but also, it's frequently argued that the Gin Palace came into being as a consequence of three key acts of parliament. And I'll say a little bit about them all um, in, in turn. So in 1829, after a great deal of, of pressure on the government uh, with a sort of financial crisis and the desire to um, harmonize different excise law in the different um, home nations, the duty on spirits was reduced from 11 shillings, eight pence and a quarter to seven shillings per gallon. So there's a, a significant reduction in the price of gin. So it was more profitable for um, people to open gin shops. That was the idea. In 1828, there's an act known as the Ale Houses Act. Now, magistrates had a great deal of control over licensing premises in London, um, and they could refuse licenses to people who they didn't think were the right kind of people or, or institutions which were in the wrong place. And it was thought with a great deal of, uh, of justice in some cases that many of these magistrates were in the pocket of the large brewing houses. So the brewers were exerting a monopoly and insisting on who could, or, uh, could open uh, a, a pub in their territories. So the Ale Houses Act, reduced the power of the magistrates, it made licensing more independent of them, therefore it was easier for these new gin, gin palace people to build their premises. And the third and final act I'll, I'll mention now, which we'll, we might come back to um, at different points, is the Beer Act. 
1830. And this is a, a motion promoted very much by the, the free traders at this point, which really took all power from the magistrates and um, the big breweries and said that anybody could sell beer from anywhere as long as they paid the two guineas for a license. And overnight, uh, thousands of these two guinea licenses were taken out and tiny beer shops were opening up all over the place, all over the country. And it was, uh, it was funny this, that government's um, uh, policy doesn't always have the effect that it, that it thinks it's going to have. And it, and it's one of these unintended consequences. So there's this sudden breakout of, of new beer houses. So the idea is, you know, to put this all together, it, it, gin became cheaper, it became easier to get a, a, a license to sell gin. Um, the gin shops had to compete with these new beer houses so they they gutted themselves up and they put big big necklaces on their barmaids and clocks outside and, and created these gin palaces. But not only was the effect of this le legislation on, on drink mongers complicated um, and not so straightforward as that account suggests, but there is evidence that gin shops were upgrading their premises much earlier than 1825, so not as a consequence of these three acts. Uh, moreover, the terminology used for various types of drinking establishments is unstable. Gin palace is a derogatory term. It's used to, to demonize um, these new places. So when uh, one reason I couldn't find gin palaces in the sort of street directories and so on is that this is not how people listed themselves. You, know, you can't sort of look in the index under gin palace. It's not good because it's an insult. It's, it's not a, a, a term that people use themselves. But there is certainly some difference between the old style ale house pub and the new style gin palace. And let me show you one very graphic example. Um, this, is, this is my old um, stomping ground. So on the, uh, the left, you have the old queen's head on the Essex Road, which was a sort of Tudorbethan, you know, multi-storied, um, mullions and you know, beams and bars. I mean, it's terribly embarrassing this in front of a group of antiquarians who know the architectural history of this so much better than I do, but it's an oldie worldie pub. In 1829, this was knocked down and a new gin palace built in its stead in this. Uh, and this is a, a fairly recent photo and this frontage, which has since been decorated again, this frontage dates from about 1900, but you get the impression of an utterly different type of building. This big, old, comfortable sort of country pub, and then this little urban place with columns, bright lights. It almost certainly had a clock and, and pretty barmaids on the inside in those days. So you can see that it was, it was absolutely different in appearance, but it's still, it's kind of plainish. It doesn't have that the sense of the sort of shock and awe that you find in Dickens' account. And I think if you have a, maybe you do have a mental image of a gin palace, you might have something more in mind of the Princess Louise in Hoburn, which is still, I gather, a very good drinking establishment. Bright lights, uh, a sign like a shop sign, um, cut glass, big, big windows instead of little mullioned windows, a long curving mahogany bar, beautiful ceilings, or the Argyle Arms in, in Soho, very similar features and this lovely um, etched glass in the corridor there. So you, you get the sense of walking into somewhere really special and luxurious and beautifully lit, lit in a way that no poor person would be able to light their houses. But are these places, the Argyle Arms and um, the Princess Louise really gin palaces? Look at the dates, 1872 and 1868, whereas this big gin palace crisis was happening in the early 1830s. So what's, what's going on there? And let's compare these so-called uh, gin palaces. And the websites for these places, especially the, the Princess Louise, say it's, it's decorated in the gin palace style. So they are, they are playing on that association. Now, one of the the first of the so-called gin palaces that I mentioned earlier, Thompson and Fearant in Hoban Hill, um, was 
developed between 1829 and 1832. And here are the architect's drawings, which are, are uh, uh, at Riva. And the guy who, um, the guy, the architect who designed this building, John Buonarotti Papworth, as many of you may know, is the architect of Regency Cheltenham. Now, my mother lived in Cheltenham, and my mother is a terrible snob, and she would say, it's so scruffy, so scruffy. But most people would not think that Cheltenham was scruffy or meretricious or down market. It's really quite smart. Um, and the exterior of Thompson and Ferens has no gaudy clock or lights or flashy sign. Its, it's windows are, are fairly small. So there's a lot of exaggeration in these accounts of what the Gin Palace was like. And there's also a deliberate attempt of Thompson and Ferens throughout their long career as, um, as, as, as gin mongers and, and wine merchants to insist on their respectability. They didn't just sell to the indigent poor that Cruikshank depicts. They also did a very healthy trade with the middle classes. The middle classes were stopping going to uh, public houses to a large extent in London. They're getting, they're getting their drinks sent to them. They're, it was off sales. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's their wine club deliveries that were much more important to the middle classes. So let's, let's think a bit more about what we mean then by a gin palace and what the alternative names are. On the left, there's a list of some of the traditional names for the older style drinking establishments. And on the right, there's a list of names associated with gin and spirits, which became very popular from the 18th century. Um, so we have the traditional names of inn, tavern, alehouse, public house, and beer shop or beer house. Beer shop and beer house are the names that came in after 1830 when people could sell you know, small quantities of beer literally from their front room if they wanted to without making any great adaptation. Gin shop was a very, very common name for any place that sold gin, no matter what style it was. But people also refer to dram shops, you know, just taking a little dram, a wee dram, and a little drink of spirits, liquor shop, spirit shop, gin palace, or one that comes in in the 19th century is wine vault. So uh, gin palace is the derogatory term, and wine vault is the euphemism that gin sellers liked to use themselves. And they did also, because when we talk about gin palaces, the gin palaces sold other drinks too. They get associated with gin and gin is seen as a kind of poison, a particularly addictive poison. But these shops also sold beer, various kinds of cordials and wine and pretty much everything else. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind that the, that column on the left, the more traditional shops that sell mostly beer and wine, there's a, quite a strict hierarchy in these terms. The, what they sell, to whom they sell it, and the design of the premises vary enormously. So at the, at the top of the social hierarchy, you have the inn, which is usually quite a grand establishment that provides accommodation and food for travelers. And it would be a respectable place that uh, a, a gentlewoman would, would feel able to go into. The tavern is, um, didn't provide accommodation, but it also provided food. And again, food is a crucial distinction. And it served wine. Might also serve spirits, but it served primarily wine. And it was catering to the gentry. The ale house covers um, quite a large range of establishments. It could be a very small place run by you know, a little old lady who was brewing in her back garden and then would just bring you a jug and serve it over and over at the table. Or it could be, and this is the sort of um, nostalgic idea that when the gin palace came in, people were saying, let's bring back the old ale house. This is what we really want, this merry old England idea of the ale house. And the ale house, or as it came to be called the public house, had several key features. It had seating. And the gin shop is famous for people going in and standing at the counter, having a drink and going away. The ale house or public house had a tap room. And this is a room with fixed wooden benches and tables 
that the laboring classes would sit with their pipe and their tankard of beer. They would call for their beer and it would be served to them and brought to them by a tap boy. There would, might well be a parlor with smarter furnishings. There might be pictures on the walls, um, chairs rather than a bench. And you might get the landlord himself would come and serve you. But basically it was table service and it provided food. Um, and in, the, in some of the alehouses, working people could bring their food to be cooked there. They could bring a joint of meat that they didn't have, they, they couldn't afford to cook at home, and they would have it cooked for them there. The beer shop or beer house, which is the post-1830 thing, is rather different. So you have this, a, a place where food is served, and as, as we know, if you drink without eating food, you do get drunker quicker. And if you're poor and you don't have very much food to eat, you get drunker even quicker. So one of the, the obvious links between the, the gin shop and the drunkenness of the poor is that they were sometimes drinking on empty stomachs because they were too poor to eat. Also, the, the social segre segregation that was built into the architecture of the alehouse or pub house is something that magistrates and middle class commentators were very keen to reinstate to the extent that even though after 1828 magistrates had less control over the licensing of premises, they still acted, they, they sent in people to um, destroy bars and they, they brought in carpenters to reinstate a tap room. Um, and the publicans who had just spent sometimes upwards of 5,000 pounds or more on their French mahogany, bars and their mirrors and all their barrels and things like that were, were aghast that this expense that, that they just invested was, was wiped out. And also that their private property was being invaded by somebody whose legal claim to do so was quite dubious. So there are heated debates in the press and in Parliament about the powers of the magistrates. These magistrates were sometimes um, thought to be, as I said, in the pockets of the brewers, but also were very often um, associated with temperance movements and with evangelical Christian movements. Sometimes they were generally trying to help the poor, but so there's a, there's a real ideological battle going on around the reinstatement of the tap room and the removal of the bar. And there's a lovely description of um, this um, ideal of the old uh, alehouse or pub from Lee Jackson. There were roving staff to take orders, ferrying drinks hither and thither. There were some disreputable public houses, but the ideal alehouse was a model of segregated social harmony. The tradesmen sat happily in a slightly more select and expensive parlor. The humble laborer frequented the tap room, and they both formed part of a temporary fellowship under the watchful eye of a convivial, respected publican. So the, the physical position of the publican is another interesting factor here, I think. So I mentioned the bar, and I think we're very familiar with, I mean, maybe you don't go to pubs, but you know, the pubs usually have bars, don't they? And the, the publican is, is behind the bar. But let's look at what, um, how Samuel Johnson defines a bar. So this is the, you know, 1755. So his first definition of a bar is a piece of wood, iron, or other matter laid across a passage to hinder entrance. So it's, it's a barrier, it's something to stop you. And that idea carries through to the 18th century definition of a bar. It's an enclosed place in a tavern or coffee house where the housekeeper sits and receives reckonings. So there was a, a, an enclosed space in the old alehouse, quite like a reception desk in a hotel where the publican sat. And you would call for a drink and he would come out from behind the bar, go down into the cellar and fetch it to you. It's not a place where anybody could rush to the front and shove and get served straight away and directly with people getting their orders out very quickly because the, the, the publican would have a look at you, keep his watchful eye on you and say, oh, he's had too much to drink. I'm not gonna serve her again. She didn't pay last time. So where does this idea of the bar come from? Shops. Gin shops were known as shops, weren't they? It's a place where you, you buy gin and shops retailing all sorts of goods were being developed in the, in the Regency period. And there are those magnificent developments of Regent Street, the, the West End of London was 
developing beautiful, bright, enticing shops, trying to get people to come in and buy their goods. So that model of the retail premises, the shop was being transferred to the um, consumption of gin, whereas the model of the alehouse was of somebody's house where the host was serving you. So it's a very different kind of feeling. Now, as I said, there was um, a lot of opposition to uh, the gin shop because of its, its shoppy nature. And also because the, the design, I mentioned the bar and also I mentioned the doors, didn't I? That the, that whole design led to a, a totally different way of serving the customer. So the, 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 when people wanted to restore the tap room, they wanted people to have to go through the tap room in order then to find somewhere else where they could buy gin. So you had to pass through something else, whereas these gin shops were designed as a, a room that entered directly onto the street. So you could pop in off the street on these doors that swung on these wonderful hinges, like saloon doors in, um, in cowboy films. And it often had a second, so she, you could come in, you know, you'd imagine coming in through that door, you'd, you'd knock on the door, you get your pretty barmaid with her big necklace to serve you your dram, and then you'd toss it back very quickly because these are little drinks, it's not a long pint of beer you're gonna spend ages drinking, and then you nipped out at the other door. So there's a, a lovely account in the Daily Current of no less than 269,438 persons entered the 14 principal gin palaces of London and its suburbs in one week, viz. 142,415 men, 108,593 women, and 18,391 children. That at Fearon's, one of these on Hoban Hill, there entered in one day 2,880 men, 1,855 women, and 280 children. Total 5,024, and in one week, 16,988. So you have to imagine a person with a clipboard <laughs> counting all these people. These story, they must have been on some sort of terrific conveyor belt. It's, an, it's a machine. It's, it's an engine to sort of... Uh, have people flow through in it like an industrial production. But you remember that image of, uh, of, of the, um, the Cheltenham architect's version of, of Fearon's? Here's an image of Fearon's round about 1860 from a slightly different angle. This is it, it's here. It's next to the shop with the awning. And um, Fearon pointed out in, a, in an article, he, he finally got a, a reply through the time saying that how could you possibly get those thousands and thousands of people in and out of, out of my establishment, which he says comprises one room precisely 15 foot wide by 11 feet and eight inches deep. It's just not possible. So he's using you know, one set of statistics against another. Nonetheless, the inhabitants, so the, the magistrates took it upon themselves to try to um, destroy the gin palace, to restore the tap room, to restore a kind of model of social order. But the, um, the gin shop owners fought back. And here's a really rather strange piece that I found uh, a pamphlet of 90 pages published in 1816 called Wine Vaults Vindicated, Remarks Upon the Partial and Arbitrary Conduct of Magistrates with Respect to Publicans, Licenses, Brewers, Leases, etc., etc., etc. And it complains about the cruel and unjust treatment of retailers of wines and spirits. And this chapter early on in the pamphlet says, there is no such thing, positively no such thing, as a gin shop. Hang on, <laughs> we've just spent a lot of time looking at how there were these gin palaces and, and gin shops. And he goes through um, a number of, of points and some of them I think he's, he's quite right. It's 70 pages of close reasoning with plenty of side swipes at the brewing trade, the overzealous magistrates and hypocritical rich people who try to deny the poor their pleasures. According to him, 
the wine vaults in the city are conducted with regularity and order. The people who run them are highly respectable. The people who drink there get less drunk because gin is a lot less strong than it was in, in Hogarth's day. And it's sold in well-regulated premises rather than the squalid sites depicted by Hogarth. She keeps using this term wine vault as much more social cachet than gin shop. And they did sell wine as well, and they also had to sell a bit of beer. They didn't necessarily sell very much beer, but they had to sell a bit of beer in order to get a license. The, the primary drink being sold was gin. But he says, no, 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 these are superior, these are wine vaults. So he was kind of taking back control and trying to control the language and saying, this is what, this is how we market ourselves. This is our term for what we do. And he made the point that the horrors which gin and gin drinking inspired about the middle of the last century, in Hogarth's prints, have been transferred by ignorance and prejudice in some measure to our own times. That, and he, he concludes that there is no such thing as a gin shop, such as is portrayed by the historian and portrayed by Hogarth. So it's not that gin shops don't exist, but that people are assuming that the modern gin shop is like Hogarth's gin shop. He says that that's, that's quite wrong. So what part of what's happening, and this will be my last point, is that there's a, there's a dispute about language and terminology. But this is also a trade war. You know, it, it's akin to the battle between Uber and the black cabs. So th there's a disruptor coming into the market, setting up a new model and upsetting the status quo. And there's, there's right and wrong on both sides, but it certainly generated a lot of heat and not very much light. Now, I, my, my very last um, sentence is, so where does this all lead me? I wouldn't agree with the author of Wine Vaults Vindicated and say there's no such thing as a gin palace, nor am I ready to prove or disprove William's claim that there were 5,000 gin palaces in London. More, I would need to do more work on the nature and number of spiritual retailers. What is clear is that the 19th century experienced a moral panic about the drinking practices of the poor akin to the 18th century panic about gin. And as in the 18th century, this moral panic was partly motivated by a desire to suppress the pleasure of the lower classes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, that was a fascinating insight into a period of uh, the past that I am not entirely familiar with. Um, and uh, I think you've given us a, a, a lot to think about there. Um, I'm going to invite questions from the room and um, online. If you want to ask a question in the room, if you could raise your hand, there will pass the mic there, and uh, I think Annabel will give me any. Um, online uh, question. Can I just kick off with the first question, Judith? Is um, I've got a very clear impression, if you like, of the, um, the social conflict that we're seeing played out through um, gin palaces or the, the language around gin palaces. Um, is there an economic uh, story behind this in the sense that um, the burgeoning of the production of gin is presumably um, quite a large capital intensive uh, industry, which is uh, involved in the, that architecture that you, you yeah. present. That's, that's a good point. I mean, there, there are two aspects of the, um, the production of, of both beer and gin, and that is the, the availability of and the price of the, the grain that's used as the basis of both of them. And so productions of alcohol uh, fluctuate. With, with prices of grain, and those are affected very often by war. So there are, um, there are, there are issues around uh, the, the price of grain. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the, legis the 18th century legislation did was to um, put a, 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 a limit on the size of the still. So in, in, the, in the 18th century, you had distill something in something, you know, you know yay big, you know something that would fit in a small room at the back of the house, but that was producing lots of these little gin shops. Um, there's a little bit of a trade battle or uh, a power battle with the Worshipful Society of Distillers. Um, and the government introduced a, a minimum size of the still 
And so that drove a lot of the little people out of business. So actually a lot of the spirits were being distilled by the bigger distillers and some of them were, were moving. Beef Eaters is one of the, uh, Robert um, knows a lot about this, Beef Eaters is one of the, the big distillers that was increasing in size and moving to bigger premises. So the production of spirit was being concentrated. Um, there, there's a smaller number of bigger distillers arising in that period. Questions? I think the microphone is going to come to you so we can all hear. I'm sorry about the time. I was looking at that clock, which um, tells quite a different time from the clock on the computer screen. <laughs> Whoops, I should have known that, shouldn't I? <laughs> so this is antiquary time. <laughs> yes. Um, can you tell me, was there a difference, the world was a difference in the proof as time went on? Because you mentioned it being very strong when we saw the Hogarth yeah, thing. Yeah. And then you mentioned that it became weaker. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly difficult to tell the proof um, in the past. And I can't remember the precise date. There was a, a piece of equipment invented, I think, by a French chemist to test the, 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 the proof. Um, the other issue with proof is that gin was almost always watered down. Um, so as with, with street drugs, as I'm sure you know, it's sometimes cut with talcum powder or, or bicarbonate of soda or something like that. And you can be sold something. You're being told that this is a really potent in, intoxicant when actually you're getting something that, that's largely water. But the, the wine vaults vindicated guy argues that uh, British spirit is well below proof and that Scots and Irish whiskey is above proof and so that British gin is actually better for you. So following on from my first two questions, how did it actually compare in terms of you know, the price of gin compared to beer, wine, other spirits like whiskey or cognac or brandy, in terms of the disposable income of the sort of people who have yeah. frequented the palaces? Yes. Now, I'd, I'd have to sort of pull out lots of charts and tables because the, the price um, did fluctuate. And also there's the sort of the, 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 the price per unit of alcohol so that you, you could get drunker with a, a, a penny tot of, of gin than you could with a, a penny's worth of, of beer. Um, I, I can't give you a, a sort of a, a neat answer at the moment without sort of pulling out uh, tables for you. But th there is a sense that or a, a complaint by employers and um, concerned citizens and moral commentators that the poor were spending their money on intoxicants rather than on food. And the fact that some workers were paid in pubs, they're given their wages in pubs so that they would immediately spend it behind the bar um, is, is, is a part of that. Um, there was also a belief that beer being made from grain was basically a food and that is, uh, laborers could uh, you know, do really quite a lot of, of work on a couple of pints of beer because it was nourishing, whereas spirits sat the strength. So there, there, is, there are some interesting and complex links between labor and alcohol. Why are there kids in pubs? Why the kids pubs? That's a very good question. Um, Sometimes th there's some of the um, the bars that had a, a little low bar for the children so they could get served. Um, some of them probably were drinking, um, and certainly the satires and the attacks on pubs demonstrate mothers pouring gin down their children's throats. You see it in the Hogarth engraving and in the Crookshire engraving. But the other thing, and the defenders of of of, of gin shops would say that the children are very often buying gin to take home their parents. And it's very hard to know <laughs> at this stage what they were doing, but a lot of sales of gin were off sales that you could bring your own. I mean, you know, I bring keep cup when I go to a coffee shop now, you could bring your own gin version of the keep cup and get it filled up and the child might, might take it home. But you're right, it, it, is, it is absolutely, you know, you know, jaw dropping to see these children in, in pubs. And I mean, from a fictional um, depiction, I don't even remember in David Copperfield, some, almost the saddest bit is when David Copperfield 
is wandering around as a child and the only place for him to go to keep warm and to get some food is in a pub. So another factor is, is warmth. Here's a well-lit, warm space full of people that might be nicer than sitting on a doorstep. Thank you for that talk, it's fascinating. This may be a little bit of an unfair question, but my mind started racing as you were talking. Um, modern day deregulation has given rise to the betting shop. Again, gaudy, drawing people in, and uh, the more vulnerable people in society being vulnerable. What other similarities do you see between or differences between modern times and yeah. in palaces? That's, that's a very good question because there are lots of, uh, Things such as the price of drink, the, the, the betting regulation, um, uh, ultra-processed foods, these things which have become staples of the life of, of the poor, you know, fast food, junk food, that the government is repeatedly being asked to legislate on and then falling short of bringing in legislation. And there are, there are sort of push and pull uh, factors there, I think. One is, and this is something that definitely affected government thinking in the 18th and 19th century, is that you don't actually want to stop people from drinking or smoking completely because it's a major source of revenue for the government that excise you know, duty on alcohol, tobacco, um, that these things bring in a lot, of, a lot of revenue. And another argument made by, for example, the, the, the gambling uh, companies who do very great um, sort of social engineering, the way they run their websites and the games that they run, it's, it's, it's completely addictive, um, so I've heard, um, that they are, they are providing solace and pleasure for the poor. Why shouldn't the poor have their pleasures? So, yeah, I think, I think you're right to point out the similarities. And even you know, a few years ago, um, the, the argument that Jessica Warner makes in her book about the gin craze is the, the comparison between deregulation of, of class A drugs or class B drugs. Similar sort of addictive things that are, you know, how much harm are they causing? How much freedom should people have? Um, are the, the sellers of these things exploiting their customers? Does the government really want to, to stamp it, it out in order to protect the, the customer, or do they want to continue to use it as a, as a cash cow? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a grim subject, isn't it, really? Yeah. A question, only because I worked in local government elected, and this awful uh, dilemma that you have about issuing licenses, whether it would be for, to sell alcohol for yet another pub, uh, closing mm. or uh, gambling mm. um, but of course the alternative is uh, organized crime you push it yeah. under and they yeah. would that's uh, without having ever done the research that's exactly what would have been the issue here I imagine yeah yeah uh, you put it you it's we don't like it you don't have to go in there but if if it if you make it illegal and you over regulate you push it underground and that's when people die yeah, yeah. and then then there are more um yeah, the more, more deaths of the, the, the people drinking adulterated products, but also fights over there. And that certainly happened in the 18th century that some of the, I think, eight gin acts in the 18th century, some of them tried to stamp out gin shops altogether. They put it underground and they, they decided that actually it was better to issue licenses to respectable people and monitor the premises and allow police in to, to check the premises. Yeah, it's a good, a good, good topic. Did you find anything of, that was kind of scaremongering about accidents in distillery work? Ooh. There's explosions and things, mm, aren't there? If you're yeah. not doing it right. I haven't yet, but I'll now look. Because <laughs> they are, oh, yeah, you're right. They're very, very dangerous places. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anybody else knows about that. That's a good subject. Um, wonderful talk, obviously, Judith. Um, I wondered, though, uh, you were obviously talking about London, um, and I wondered if there was a, a kind of European aspect to this. I mean, when you were talking about Dickens, I was immediately thinking about Zola um, and La Samoire and that idea yeah, of, of, yeah, of the yeah, shop. Yeah. Um, so is this a national thing, or does it also have a, a European or an international perspective, that whole idea of the gin wars? Yeah, 
that's a, that's a really good question that I can only give a very sort of um, limited answer to. I think the, the the culture of drink is quite different in different countries, isn't it? I mean, the, the French wine drinking uh, culture, um, and even now, you know, workmen going in for a quick Dubonnet at the start of the day in these bars, a little coffee, a little nip of something, a little something strong to keep you going. Um, there is some of the visitors to Britain talk about the hard drinking culture of the British and they think that it's distinct. They think that the British drink more. And there's a lovely article, um, I had a long quotation, which I didn't want to um, to show in the end, of an American correspondent saying how appalling it is and pointing out, as, as Americans sometimes do now, actually everybody in England drinks all the time, all day, all, all ages. So England has a reputation for hard drinking. And that's not to say that other countries don't also have, um, but I think it, it kind of signifies differently country by country. And also I think in that way that people compare themselves to each other. So when um, gin came to Britain uh, at, the, at the end of the, the 17th century with King William, people were talking about Dutch courage, that you know, the Dutch were cowards because we were busy fighting them at that, at that point and they had to have a drink in order to fight us. And yeah. That didn't last when the Dutch suddenly became our, our friends and things. Um, if the customers were so poor, how could these establishments be so lavishly set up? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I can't see the question there, but um, the, oh, it's an online question. Oh, yes. So I think the thing is that the, the turnover was so good. So the profit came from this rapid turnover of people buying you know, just a little tot or maybe a few little tots and coming and going very quickly, that, that the profit could be greater than that for um, an establishment with a tap room where a couple of old men were nursing a pint for hours on end. So there's so many people buying the spirits. Also the spirit is, is quite cheap and easy to produce. I mean, it's one of the reasons why, um, and they're producing very good gins now, but one of the reasons why the Scottish whiskey distillers are moving into gin is that you know whiskey takes what minimum five years 12 years to make a good whiskey gin 48 hours <laughs> so you could you could you can make a saleable drink quite quickly and cheaply and i think probably it takes even less time than beer so so the costs and the volume of sale and also it was a punt it was an investment and if you think about the money that disruptors uh, pour into their um their, their enterprises in order to drive other people out of competition. That might have been part of the gamble they were making. Um, Judith, you've um, dealt with uh, questions in an exemplary way. You gave us fantastic lecture. So can I ask um, people to uh, thank you for what's been a great <laughs> Um, Thank you for being such a stimulating audience. Um, I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 13th of October at 5 p.m., online only. Um, we will hear a paper, The Archaeology of the Westward Austronesian Expansion by Dr. Alison Crowder, FSA. The meeting's